We're filming today at Mont Alto, part of the original Jefferson Estate at Monticello. And this is a wonderful hill that overlooks Monticello and gives us a great view of the house. If you look below, you'll see the house, Monticello and the estate. And today's lecture is about slavery, and we thought this would be a good place to start because we can get an overview of the institution. Uh, Jefferson owned some 607 slaves over the course of his life. He sold about 100, mostly in the 1790s. Some of these were gifts to family members. And uh, that was during a period in which he devoted much of his efforts in his first retirement from serving in the federal government to improving his plantation. And so let's take a, a brief look at Jefferson's plantation and see if we can figure out the geography of slavery at Monticello. You start at the house, of course, this is where the house servants uh, lived and worked. And uh, those are the slaves who are most familiar to us, uh, people in the Hemings family, including Sally Hemings, his uh, uh, concubine or his mistress later in life. And if we move to the right, uh, down the hill, you'll see the garden. He was very proud of his garden, and in this garden, it was a sort of an experimental place where he would see what vegetables could be adapted to this part of the world. Uh, this was for the purposes of feeding the many and people who lived at Monticello, but also it was a, a kind of a scientific laboratory for Jefferson. Uh, of course, slaves were involved in the garden, skilled slaves, and there were more skilled slaves right above the garden. If you see a row of trees there and you can see a road going in behind those trees, that's Mulberry Row. And that's where skilled artisans had their shops. This is where Jefferson established a nailery to produce nails and exploiting the labor of young boys and producing for local markets. So he was on a small scale into industrial manufacture, but the real plantation, of course, is spread far beyond across those 5,000 acres that Jefferson owned here. But you don't see them when you look at the mountain. You see what to us looks like a park or a forest. And part of that area was a deer park at one point in Jefferson's life. And it established a very unusual scene for uh, racial slavery in Virginia. Jefferson built at the top of a little mountain. That's what Monticello means in Italian. And it's a bizarre place to build. It's inefficient. It's uh, hard to get there. It's hard to improve the landscape, that is to level the top of the mountain. A tremendous engineering feat, actually a tremendous feat for all the slaves who worked on it. But one of the things that Jefferson was doing was establishing how unusual he was. He set up a juxtaposition between civilization and nature. Uh, those trees and that uh, topography were very important to him. It's unprecedented in Virginia. Before we go on up to the top of Mont Alto, this wonderful hill overlooking Monticello, a couple of observations are in order. First, Jefferson keeps his distance from most of his slaves. Uh, this is important. It's, uh, he keeps meticulous records. He knows who they all are and he seeks to manage them intelligently. But it's hard to say that there's much of a personal relationship with the vast number of his, of his slaves. Most Virginia plantation houses would be located in the center of what would amount on the bigger plantations to a kind of agricultural village, uh, almost reminiscent of a manor in Britain with a village nearby. But that relationship that Jefferson has with his slaves is mediated. It's uh, buffered by the surrounding landscape, which he has very self-consciously designed to establish himself in relation to nature. The second thing to keep in mind is that Jefferson built on top of a mountain in order to command a view this great viewscape, 360 degrees, only interrupted or punctuated, you might say, by Mont Alto, where we are right now. And Jefferson was a kind of natural philosopher, a philosopher of nature. And he saw himself standing in relationship to nature as a civilized gentleman. And uh, 
a philosophical gentleman who had a broader view of things, who looked west and imagined the future of the country. That's a familiar conceit when we talk about Jefferson. And he loved to talk about the prospects for Charlottesville and the surrounding area, for Virginia, and for the whole country. But Jefferson also took the big view of slavery. And this is what we're going to explore in today's lecture when we get to the top of this mountain. <music>